Hello, thanks for once again taking the time to download and listen to one of our podcasts. This is a football fans podcast and people behind Celtic Underground.net. Maybe the January transfer window, but that doesn't stop us from having loads and loads of podcasts. So we had Lawrence Donegan on from the By The Minute uh, last couple of days ago. And today we've got Paul Quigley from Fans Against Criminalisation. And he's on to discuss the latest position in the potential repeal of the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act. Shortly we'll have someone who will give us a key insight into the transfer dealings at Celtic Park in a January transfer window. Uh, it will be a really interesting podcast and it will be out at uh, the beginning of February, hopefully. So that's one to look forward to and there'll be other stuff in between. But uh, before we get on to Paul's podcast, just a reminder that the latest Celtic Foundation thing is to walk on fire on Friday the 23rd of February. You can do a fire walk at Celtic Park. Uh, raising a minimum of £130 if you can for Celtic being 130 years old go on to the Celtic FC Foundation website or you can just Google uh, as I did to find the article to be able to tell you what date it is uh, Firewalk Celtic Foundation and you'll find it anyway next up is Paul if you've been following anything to do with the Offensive Behaviour of Football Act you might have seen him giving evidence to the Scottish uh, Government Committee on the potential repeal and the consequences of the Act. My own position pretty clear. I know some people listening to this from previous discussions are in favour of the principle of the Act. My own position is pretty clear. you hear it in the podcast. If something's really so bad that you need legislation, I just don't understand why you would say it's only so bad if it happens during a football game. Uh, if I were you, I'd follow Celtic Research. She posts up brilliant statistics about uh, how the issues in Scottish society that are trying to tackle with the Act happen least at the football. So anyway, enough of me, far more detail here from Paul and he tells you what to do. And if you go into the Celtic FC, uh, Celtic Underground rather, website, you will get links on what to do next if this podcast motivates you. Are you going to try to make this work? So I'm joined right. now by uh, Paul Quigley. Um, how are you doing, Paul? I'm fantastic. Thanks very much. How are you? I'm, I'm excellent, thanks. Um, now, you're on here and we're going to be talking, for people who don't know, you can explain in a minute, uh, we're going to be talking about the offensive behaviour at Football mm-hmm. Act and FAC and the work that you have been doing and um, evidence to the Scottish Parliament, etc. But before any of that... We do have to check your own Celtic underground, so we do have to check your <laughs> credentials here. So what was your first yep. Celtic game and who was your first Celtic hero? The first game I can ever remember going to was, I used to go with my uncle. Um, my dad worked abroad a lot, uh, so my uncle would take me to the games and uh, he would make me, you know, I'll take you to the game, just don't tell your mum that I'm out here drinking this bottle of fast and stuff like that. And um, I think the first thing I'd done was run back and tell my mum, but eh, uh, eh, uh, the first game I remember was the, the Aberdeen game at home when George Cadet scored and it was oh, so right, loud yeah, that it knocked yeah. off the, the I don't know if it was a radio or the television at the time but I remember it knocked off the BBC that was my first ever memory that Cadet goal um, but my, my, my hero when I was growing up even before then and, was, and, and still is I guess the largest end was Paul McStay um, it's just the same for but he was the same birthday as him as well and he was he was always my hero growing up and I don't think that'll ever change to be honest. So um what was it about Paul McStay, apart from having the same name? Well, for me for me the thing about Paul McStay, it wasn't he just his ability. Now you look at the time Especially in the kind of mid nineties, you know, the Celtic team was uh, certainly not um, hitting the heights. You know, it was a very poor side. So, in about the time that you know Bosman comes in as well, and you know, players are, are all of a sudden seeing that they can make moves abroad for nothing. Um, you know, John Collins goes to Monaco, and the truth is, at his prime, um, you know, Paul Paul McStay could have went anywhere. He could have left Celtic and went and played his football anywhere in Europe that he wanted to. 
um, but he chose to, to stay with Celtic through thick and thin and for me uh, that makes him a hero worth remembering I guess So oh, we could we could talk about Celtic uh, all night but you're on here uh, for a, a wider football matter <laughs> uh, and that's to discuss the Offensive Behaviour of Football Act people who listen to this podcast will know uh, my position uh, on this yep. and we've had James Kelly on talking about the attempts to repeal the Act and Jeanette from the Trust has been on and people yep. who've been following it online may have seen you in some of the edited highlights or extended highlights <laughs> online so do you yep. want to just talk about what, what you've been doing and, and what's happening and where we are with it? Right, okay. Um, so obviously fans against criminalisation were formed, uh, you know, back in looking at summer of two thousand and eleven when the Offensive Behaviour Football Act was first muted as a, a piece of emergency legislation at the time by Alex Salmon, um, you know, following the so called game that happened earlier that year. Um, at the time, you know, the fans against criminalisation was made up of the five main Celtic fan organisations, but it was never intended to be exclusive to Celtic fans. Because we knew that, you know, whilst I certainly think that much of it was targeted towards our support, um, the other fans would feel the blunt of it as well, and that, that's certainly how things have played out. Um, now, we've been campaigning ever since then for, uh, well, since it was voted in anyway, for the, the repeal of the legislation, whilst also trying to help people who've been uh, charged under it. Now, you know, we've tried many things, I guess, over the course of the years, but at this point, I guess things properly changed in the summer of 2016 when the SNP um, lost their overall majority, um, which meant that there was therefore a majority of um, MSPs who actually supported the repeal of the legislation. Um, and then up to that election, we'd done a lot of campaigning, we'd been at Parliament, there was National Days of Action across Scotland. Um, and that's really what uh, forced the issue and it meant that all of the opposition parties the Green Party the Labour Party the Tories the Lib Dems all of them made manifesto pledges to repeal the legislation Um, so ever since that election that's what we've all kind of been collectively working on even if you know there'll certainly be uh, members of fact that uh, you know, we certainly wouldn't hold a lot of common ground with some of the people we're working with, but we agree on this much, um, and we're obviously working towards a repeal. Now, in terms of the repeal process, I can go into that in a bit of detail just now, if you want. Yeah, that would be good, that. yeah, yeah because it. obviously, lots, lots of us, um, we maybe have a, some people listening to this will, will be in favour of it, some people will be neutral mm-hmm. and some people will be against it. A lot of the people yeah. who are maybe neutral or against it and, and have a, a, and even for it, they'll have a passing interest up for a lot of people. Yeah. And they'll just be aware that there's been talk of it being repealed, but it's not okay. been repealed, so it'd be useful. Yeah. Okay, so uh, when a, it, 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 just a, a normal, whenever an act is passed through uh, the Scottish Parliament, there's three stages to that. Now, we're just approaching the end of stage one for the repeal bill. Now, stage one is by far and away the longest kind of part of that process, if you will. It would start with uh, a consultation. Now, James Kelly lodged his consultation. This gave um, you know people across Scotland uh, the opportunity to submit the uh, evidence of their experiences of that and their opinions and thoughts and things like that. Um, and a number of responses for that, I think it was over 3,500, um, was the, the biggest response of its kind for, for that kind of consultation um, in the Scottish Parliament website. Um, and over 72% of those who responded to it um, were strongly in favour of repealing the act. So that's really what gave us the, uh, the foundation, I guess, to, to, to kind of build for the repeal from that point and move it into the parliamentary chamber. Um, so what happens then is because it's uh, a justice issue that gets put to uh, the Justice Committee, what they then sought to do was gather evidence of their own. They requested more written submissions, which they got from, um, you know, they would get from individuals, but at that point there was a real focus on the kind of quality of the, the submissions rather than the, the quantity. So you, you've seen lots of submissions from the likes of Liberty, the Law Society, um, you know, BMS, the Black and Ethnic Minority Institute of Scotland, groups like that who strongly opposed the Offensive Behaviour Act. Um, and then what the, the Parliament done was, or the Justice Committee done was, they requested 
uh, to gather oral evidence from you know various experts and interested parties, um, and that included Friends Against Criminalisation herself, myself, and Jeanette Finley went along in October, I believe it was. Um, and since then, they've held evidence gathering sessions. They, they held them almost every week or two, right up until December. Um, so they've finished now in terms of the kind of investigation, as it were, in terms of gathering as much evidence as you can as a parliamentary body. And now um, what they'll do is they'll make a report and a recommendation within that report. Then that's due shortly, um, and that will be published for people to see on the Justice Committee website, but Fans Against Criminalisation will also circulate that quite widely when it comes out. What the good thing is, is that we're nearly at the end of stage one. Now, what has to happen at the end of stage one is the full of parliament votes on the principles of the bill, um, and that has to happen by the 26th of January. So that's why Fans Against Criminalisation today started our email campaign to try and put the pressure on, so to speak, because... Uh, as it works out, um, we only have a, the margin of victory, the distance between uh, votes in our favour and votes against us, it's, it's down to two votes. So what we have to do uh, is try and make sure that politicians across the country know that we are watching them and that we expect them uh, to vote in favour of the appeal after following the damage that this act has done uh, across Scotland. Um, one stat's um, once that vote's been had it'll move to stage 2 which is actually quite quick that'll be the amendment stage mm-hmm. but given this is a repeal bill and not new legislation it's not really expected that that part of the process will be particularly long uh, so in reality all we'll have to kind of go over again is um, some of the issues with the live cases and things like that but everything else um, is kind of settled that should really only take we would hope one meeting of the Justice Committee um, and then from that point we go into stage 3 which is a full debate in the parliamentary chamber um, and then it goes to the, the, the final vote uh, the second and final vote at the end of stage 3 and once we've if we win that, uh, then the Act will be repealed. All we have to do is wait a few weeks for the Royal uh, for the Royal Assent, for the Queen to sign it, um, and then it's gone. Uh, um, but I guess the, I think the, the thing that we would like to stress more than anything is that it's not quite done yet. You know, we've had you know, seven years of this campaign, six years of the Act in place, um, and throughout that at that time, the Celtic support have been absolutely incredible. You know, they've supported fans against criminalisation um, throughout, you know, be it by helping with the email campaigns, by showing up at demonstrations, um, by supporting the legal fund for people who have been charged. Uh, and I think that given the given the size of what we as a support have nearly achieved here in terms of, you know, beating down government legislation, this hasn't ever happened before. This will be the first time in the history of the Scottish Parliament that the Scottish Parliament has repealed legislation that itself has enacted. It's never happened before, but, the, but our support has stood up to the government on this. Um, and with just a few months left, I think we owe it to ourselves. I think we owe it to everyone who's worked over the, the years, the, the effort the support has put in. And I think we owe it to people whose lives have been ruined, um, unfortunately, as have been caught up in this to make sure that we see out the last few months um, and that does include doing things like the email campaign you know it takes I think it's 30 seconds um, and it sends off you know emails to both your constituency MSP and your list MSPs um, to make sure that they know that we are watching and hopefully um, we'll get it by the first vote and um, certainly as the the pay scandals in February March possibly April um, you know fans against criminalisation will be um, you know, in kind of full frontal mode um, at that point, we'll be calling demonstration. I would suspect we'll be calling um, different actions, and we will be looking for the support to to back us for these final few months to help us get it, get it over the line. So, uh, how do you, why do you think I was going to say? How do you think? Why do you think that every party? other than the SNP is, is in favour of the repeal of this. Is it, some of them are just political opportunism or do you think there's a real passion amongst the opposition parties that this is just bad law? I, I think that it's just bad law. I don't think that it's ideology has anything to do with it. I think if you introduce a piece of legislation that unites Celtic fans and Rangers fans, that unites 
the Tories and the Green Party, then it, it's not down to ideology, it's not down to politics. Everyone who has any kind of cred voice on this is against it. The Law Society said that it's bad law. The Bemis Black and Ethnic Minorities Institute says that it targets ethnic minorities. Um, when you look at other groups, the Law Society, um, sorry, not the Law Society, Liberty, the biggest civil rights group in the UK, have said that it endangers civil liberties. And now the Scottish Human Rights Convention have said that it might be incompatible with the Human Rights Act. It's not about playing politics, the only ones who are playing politics on this are the SNP because they were told all of this mm-hmm. in 2011, none of this is new, you know what I mean There's, we've not come up with some new argument in the last year that, that's changed minds or, or, or changed the state of play in any way this was all told to them, you can go back you can go through YouTube and watch the evidence gathering sessions in 2011, you can go on to the website and see the submissions that were put in then by groups like the Celtic Trust and they were warned that this was going to happen so do you, th- do you, do you think with it, without getting into the, play out. the politics of it do you think this is one of the as a, as a wee aside one of the downsides of the Scottish Parliament not having a revising chamber you know, much as we, you know, most, I'm sure I most people listening to this would think that, that the House of Lords should be an elected yeah, chamber yeah, the principle like of parliamentary law goes to the Lords for the Lords to review it Fine tune it, get rid of the bad bits to put it back. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm certainly not going to come on your show and advocate the House, House Awards by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I do think there's an issue of balance. I do think there's an issue of scrutiny at the Scottish Parliament that's missing. One example I would use, um, if you don't mind making into it, was there was. Um, a few kind of qualities groups who supported the legislation and were against the repeal uh, put in evidence to the Justice Committee as such. Now, the, the Scottish Women's Convention, who are funded by the Scottish Government, were one of the groups that done that. Now, I don't know if you followed what happened with that, but they put in what I can only describe as a very dangerous submission, which, which wasn't really based on anything. Um, it seemed to insinuate that somehow women were, were more fragile and more likely to be offended by shouting at a football match which is as offensive as I can possibly imagine to the you know, many women that I go to football matches with and there were also some um, you know, really insidious suggestions that, that football matches were somehow you know, dens of you know, kind of almost sexual assault at some points, you know, and, uh-huh. and, and in a way that I felt was really rooted in, in anti-working class prejudice. But what happened was they, they, they had made this written submission. So a lot of women, understandably, who'd read it were really insulted by it and decided to contact them to say, no, no, this isn't actually an experience of defensive behaviour act at all. It doesn't, you know, none of those things actually, you know, are, are really an issue at football, certainly an issue at football, and the offensive behaviour act wouldn't tackle any of that. So I don't know. So there was 40 emails sent um, to the Scottish Women's Convention. Now, they were invited to give oral evidence at the, the Scottish Parliament, a uh, woman called Debbie Figgers. And we, we thought it was a bit odd, frankly, you know, that they, they said that they'd held consultations on the Act and that's where they'd got this evidence. We were, we were a bit, we thought it was slightly odd that, you know, uh, you know Glasgow's not a big place, you know, not, it, it's in... For, for a women's group to have consultations on the act when we follow everything on it and for us to not know about it, it seemed a bit strange but Debbie Figgers uh, when questioned on it in the Scottish Parliament she said that they held two consultations recently on the repeal of the act one with 40 women no sorry one with 60 women one with 20 women I think it was I can't quite remember what the numbers were she gave but anyway she said that they held two consultations on it and that soon unravelled and it turned out to be a, a lie to which they admitted what they'd actually done was taking the quotes from a piece of research that was actually done in 2012 um, and this would only happen after we found digging it now the, the point I'm getting at is here is that Debbie Figgers of the Scottish Women's Convention didn't get up in the morning and decide I'm going to go and lie to the Justice Committee to help the Scottish Government off their own back mm-hmm. you know I mean, that didn't ha- happen but what you see is that these groups you know this is a group who are funded by the Scottish Government who then go to bat for the Scottish Government on an issue shouldn't really be that relevant to them without 
uh, you know, they've done that, but they've also ignored, this is meant to be an advocacy group for women, and they ignored the emails of, of 40 intelligent, passionate, uh, articulate women who contacted them because it didn't, um, you know, align with... It didn't fit with the agenda, it didn't fit with what they wanted to be said. Correct. So my worry is that, you know, we, we, we tried to get this. You know, the common space ran a piece on it. But by and large, you know, all we kind of went under the carpet, so to speak, um, and nothing came of it. Now, I think there's real issues there about parliamentary uh, democracy, that if there's meant to be scrutiny, um, and, you know, you have groups like this who are funded by the Scottish Government, who are quite simply going to bat for the Scottish Government, no matter what, yeah. then it, it becomes that kind of echo chamber that creates bad legislation. And that's that that that's been this like that's been this act from the very get go. Um and I, I think that this act has really helped to bring a lot of those issues to the fore. You know, some of the blood lines that have appeared between the the government and the judiciary, some of the ways that the police um have been directed in some cases. Um, and I, I'd be here all night talking about it, but I do think there are very real issues about the way that the Scottish government have been held to account, especially when they had the absolute majority. But we can all be thankful that that's no longer the case. Yeah, I mean, certainly from from my position as an outsider looking in, it looks like they've enacted rushed legislation. Every, yeah. It's once it's enacted, everybody's telling them it's wrong, but. Mm. Uh, there's no route there's no obvious route to then say hands up this was a mistake what, let's what revise it and put it back they've actually gone the opposite way of then try to yeah. enforce what, the police to enforce it the way they want it yeah what 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 I struggle with is you know I, I seen it when it came in and you could see the arrogance of guys like Alex Hammond guys like Kenny McCaskill Stephen House you know they exuded it you know they, they really did think at that point you know, that that they could do whatever they wanted, you know, that the SNP, particularly in Scotland, were the only game in town. They were going to vomit election after election. Police Scotland um, was obviously about to be amalgamated. That gave House all the power they wanted. And these guys just kind of rode rush head over everyone. But what I find interesting is that most of the people who brought this in are gone. Mm-hmm. You know, Alex Salmon isn't first minister anymore. Kenny McCaskill was shunted basically as soon as Nicola Sturgeon got the job. Uh, House resigned in disgrace, and it looks like uh, several of his colleagues might have yep. to follow suit. Um, and Mulholland, Frank Mulholland, is, is no longer the, the Lord Advocate. So there was plenty of scope, I think, for Nicola Sturgeon to come in and say, look, um, we need a bit of a hash of this here. We need to put our hands up. And I think I think people would respect that of politicians because no politician would ever do that. They just come out and put their hands up and admit, look, we've got this wrong. And people would eat that up. And you, you can't tell me that there's been a single person who's voted for the SNP because they so strongly support the Offensive Behaviour Act. But they have lost votes over it. They absolutely have lost folks over it. So for me, the one thing that I often think about is what what, what have they had to gain by sticking by this? And you can only really conclude, or the only thing I can really conclude is that it's just stubbornness. It's just about saving face. What and I you don't want to... What, what strikes me about it is if they actually think if they revisited it or taking more time in the first place, it would have been a lot more difficult to be at the point that you're at just now. To well, I mean, that, that's one of the things. One of the things that they, they see now, and, I, and you've got to laugh at it when you watch you know, the Justice Committee and some of them are saying, well, why don't you just talk to the government instead of uh, going for outright repeal? And, you, you know, you think, because we were banging in the government's door for, you know, five years and nobody wanted to speak to us. Nobody was willing to look at what was going wrong. They refused to have um, an early review of the Act, and then the review that they had to have legally was a washout. You know, they, they had opportunities to go back over this. They had the chance to review this and see where it was going wrong and sit down. And to be honest, whilst they had an absolute majority, you know, there was probably room to talk on certain parts of it. You know, obviously... Um, section 1-2-E the Act in terms of the Offensive Behaviour Clause was what was extremely problematic but they refused to engage they refused to sit down they refused to talk 
Um, so it's all in this chatter now about oh why don't we work t- t- together is it's just nonsense. It's it's just utter nonsense. Um, and obviously now the tables have turned a little bit. Unfortunately, uh, we're gonna chance to push for the, the field. So. Obviously, there will be people listening to this, and there are certainly mm. be football fans um, who will say, "But do you know what? I don't. I want to take my kids to football, and I don't want to hear songs about Irish republicanism or Northern Irish unionism or mm. any of that nonsense." And I'm actually quite thankful that there's a piece of legislation that's, going, that's aimed at trying to stop people talking about that stuff in the football because it's going to do football. Well, I mean, there's a difference, isn't there, between wanting people, thinking that people shouldn't sing it and thinking that people should be criminalised for singing it. And I think that's the difference. People are entitled to their opinions about politics and sport, about what should be sung on the terraces. You know, we support legislation that already existed that criminalised, you know, racist, sectarian, homophobic, uh, sexist chant and that kind of thing. Um, but to outlaw... You know, offensiveness is so subjective. What you find offensive, I might not, and, and vice versa. Um, it, it creates too much of a broad and blurring um, of what what is legally allowed. And the result of that is it's been played out, you know, in terms of people who've been arrested and people who've been dragged through the courts. Um, and, you know, I can, I, can, I can sit here and I can list the things that people have been arrested for. And I don't think that in a modern democracy, singing some of these songs as long as they're not racist sectarian overtly hateful I don't think that that should be a criminal offence well let me again people who listen to this will know my position but let me give you a, a devil's advocate mm. position do you know one of my most embarrassing days as a Celtic supporter was sitting next to the girlfriend of Adam Virgo right and she's from Brighton mm-hmm. and we were at Fur Park and our support sang IRA songs from the kickoff to the final whistle. And obviously, being from Brighton, she turned to me and said, "Why? Why were they singing those songs every single game, every single minute of the game?" And I didn't really have an answer to say anything to her. And again, there'll be people listening to this saying. What, what place have they got and do you know what you know that those songs are illegal so why are you bother singing them well I mean under the legislation the bottom line is that so many things could be construed as illegal and that's one of the issues that it creates it creates um, a confusion in law but in regards to Republican songs as I say it's not about whether you support them or not whether you personally would go to an away match and sing them for one minute or ninety. It's about whether or not people should be criminalised, thrown in jail, dragged through the courts, lose their job, have their names dragged through the papers, sometimes with a picture, sometimes with an address, because they sing a song which um, expresses a political view that you don't agree with. That's what it comes down to, in my opinion. And but again, I might not agree that the speed limit. You know, I'm just putting it the opposite way. I might, I might not agree that the speed limit should be seventy on the motorway. I think modern cars compared to the speed limit was set, set at 70, 70 years ago. Modern cars, it should be a hundred. So I should be allowed to drive at a hundred because the law's wrong. No, I, I don't think. I don't think that you can compare. You know what is meant to be a safety feature. Uh, you know, in terms of that kind of legislation, it's about safety. It's about people keeping people safe, and legislation which is about is constricting people's right to express themselves and constricting people's thought. I think that's two entirely different things. What I would say is that, as I say, under this legislation, people have been arrested for one. Uh, what well, I don't know if I should swear here on it, but just to just to um, exemplify what I'm talking about. You know, there was one Hamilton fan who was. Arrested and spent, I think it was four or five days in Greenock Prison because he was arrested at a Friday night game. Um, the local police station was was full. It was a bank holiday. He was taken or two of them actually were taken to Greenock Prison for singing "Well, Well, Fuck Your Well." Now that's what happens when you start constricting speech. If you decide that anyone who sings anything which might be considered as offensive should be arrested, you open it up to people being arrested for these kind of menial things. That's what's been happening. And the only way that a democratic society works is if 
people, whether you agree with them or not, are free to express views so long as they're not overtly hateful. Well, then part of the issue which I've noticed happening uh, in the last two years, I don't know whether as momentum has come around the repeal of the Act, this has happened more or, or not. Um, the blurring of the lines is what is, a secta- what is sectarian in Scotland seems to have come into place. Well, I, mean, I think that's been an issue for in terms of reporting a lot longer than the attention. I think in terms of you know even before the act came in, you know there, there's the term sectarianism doesn't have any legal character in Scottish law. Um, I actually thought it was really interesting listening to I think it was Anthony Hogan, his name was, who was um, the representative for the Catholic Church, um, who attended one of the Justice Committee hearing sessions, and what he he spoke about was that what we should really be looking to do is rather than referring to acts as being sectarian we should call them you know about what they specifically are so if it's anti-Catholic call it anti-Catholic if it's anti-Protestant call it anti-Protestant or anti-Semitic or whatever it might be and that way we create a more narrow definition a more specific definition sorry of what it is we mean by these terms of hate crimes but by simply bungling you know any expressions of Irish identity or British identity as being sectarian is to miss the point entirely um, and you know that's that's what's been happening uh, unfortunately in Scotland I do think you're right I think Scotland has to have a mature discussion about sectarianism about what that means and about how we tackle it but this act doesn't enable that this act actually gets in the way of it well it gets back to the point I often make and I always think you've got to be careful because it's dead easy to fall into the to the to the neutral person who's the who's the real person you need to win over in this. It's like you know anything to you know to win an election. It's the neutral people you need to win over. The people on either extreme will vote either way. And, and this, as you said, there's only two votes in it. So it's the neutral person who needs to get their weight behind, or the person who's swithering that will really be the person who pushes this over the edge. Not the people like I'm- you who've been proactive about it. No, I, again, I, I slightly disagree there just because we're at the, we're at the point in the campaign now that, you know, we've been at this, we've been at this since the summer of 2011. You know, we're, we're coming up on, um, you know, seven years of this. I think if anyone is still on the, uh, the sidelines, I'm not convinced they're going to be brought over. What we need, in my opinion, is to infuse our support base, which is primarily the Celtic support, but also, you know, small factions of active fan bases around the country to get active to make sure that they are the ones pushing I so uh, when I was saying the neutral person I was, I, what I was really meaning is the neutral person in terms of their, their activity the, the you know people will expect you to turn up and make a point about this what, what might be the, the pushing point is the person who has always been vehemently against it but didn't go well, in the uh, consultation for me, didn't do for anything me, for me, you know, I understand that there's people, you know, and you know, view, you know, sectarianism as a social sculpture in Scotland, and I get all of that. You know, we're not campaigning as pro sectarian campaigners or pro hate campaign campaigners, um, but in terms of this legislation, I think if if almost any reasonable, rational person sat down and read what was in this act and seen what had gone on. Um, I, I think you could only conclude that this act has been a disaster from start to finish. Laws should apply universally. You shouldn't have a law which discriminates against one specific sector of society. And secondly, you shouldn't have a law which criminalises something as subjective as offensiveness. Because as soon as you do that, almost everything is fair game. It gives the police carte blanche to arrest people for almost anything. And that's what's been happening. That's been the cost of it. I mean, um, I mean that, and that's what continue unless we get this repeat. And that's that's one of my big issues about it. See if a fee of communication and behaviour is so offensive that people should be arrested for it. I don't think you should. It's, it's bonkers to me that you have a situation where yeah. I. But it's only arrestable if they're football fans. See if they're. If they don't like football, but they behave in exactly the same way, we can't arrest them. <laughs> I mean, that's just bonkers. But, but, that, that, but that's, that's just that's exactly what I mean. You know, if you sit down and, and take the law to its fullest extent, it's it's madness. It's it's, it's utterly crazy. I mean, one of the things that we well, maybe a wee bit cheeky with it, but I, I, Rose Alec Cunningham, I'm sure it was her. I'm ninety five percent sure. I'm telling. I'm maybe check, but she held a 
a press conference of some sort. I was holding some type of interview uh, in a pub. Um, I think it was around about 2012, 2013. Um, and in the background, there was a Champions League game on, on one of the series. Um And in the interview, she made a kind of derogatory remark about uh, conservative MSPs um, using language that could be construed as offensive. And uh, she was reported to the police by a, a FAC supporter, I believe. And the police's response was, unfortunately, we can't arrest her. Well, not unfortunately, but we, we can't take any action on this because it's a Champions League game but had it been a Scottish football match on that telly we would have arrested her <laughs> I mean that's just utterly it's mad utterly it's mad. Mad. How, how can how can legislation be defined in such a such a clumsy way it's, it's, it's utterly utterly mad um, and I, you know when you really get down to the nitty gritty of it it's lunacy you know to have you know people you know one of the analogies is often giving you know, groups of two groups of guys going on a train and one's going to a rugby match and one's going to a football match and there's songs that they can sing that the others can't. It's it's mad. That's why you know you have to have comprehensive, universal hate crime reg- legislation which deals with hateful behaviour but whilst also protecting people's rights to freedom of speech. Um, but to single out one group in society society in the way that this act has is it's just wrong. I can't imagine I just can't imagine any other, other group in society being singled out in this way. Um, you know, I don't know if you, there was one video that we put up in fact Twitter maybe two, three weeks ago. It was like a small group of relatively young football fans, but they're a bit silent, you know, not making a noise. Mm-hmm. And the accompanying police officer came back and think that's what it was actually. And uh, the accompanying police officer walks down the carriage to announce to the rest of the train, if any of these fans are abusive or offensive to you, I want you to get in touch with us immediately. So he immediately marks them out as, you know, wrongdoers, as potential criminals, as potential offenders. And, you know, if if that video was to go up and it was to be a a group of young Asian guys and the police were walking down the scene up pointing at them saying if they do anything you come let me know there will be uproar and rightly so rightly so but with with football fans it's it's almost accepted that you'll be viewed as a criminal just off the bat in some some circumstances and that's the culture that this act has created Um, and it's it boils down in my opinion to you know that there is uh, you know society does view football fans you know, and it's certainly some parts of society view football fans as thugs and bigots and louts and, and wife beaters and drugs and whatever else. And it, this is this kind of prejudice is what has underpinned this legislation, what's allowed it to come to the fore. But it, but it is that thing of um, the whole narrative of Scotland's the greatest wee country in the world narrative. You can't be the greatest wee country in the world if you have a sectarian problem because you're supposed to be this perfect country. So it does allow them to then package it up and say, actually, it's not Scotland's fault. It's actually just those dirty down market football fans. It's their fault. And what, and what it allows them to do is it allows them to package sectarianism as a class issue when, you know, sectarianism has been rife throughout various social, you know, all social classes since before, uh, you know, Irish immigrants even got off the boat in Scotland. Um, and the other thing that allows them to do is by packaging it in, I hate to use the phrase, but, you know, the kind of old thumb, it allows them to paint it as, you know, two sides of the same coin. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's an inaccurate reflection of the kind of social circumstances in Scotland, in my opinion. Uh, I mean, one of the things I always remember, when they played, um, when the kind of New Rangers came up, and we played them in the, it was the semi-final when we, we beat them 2-0, and uh, Chris Commons and Griffith scored at Hamden. You know, the, the press building up to that, because there hadn't been a, a fiction like that in years, the press was just mean. You know, it was, you know, you couldn't pick up the papers without seeing you know, all this stuff, you know, police, but I think we read more about the police's tactics yeah. for the game than we did about Ronnie Dyla's, you know what I mean? It was just constant stuff, you know, footage of the police going to warn the players, you know, stuff about how they were going to police it, all the, the potential flashpoints, I think, one newspaper had. And then, you know, the game came and went without without any disorder at all. Um, but the, very, the front page of the Sun on the, the next day was Cops 1, Job 0, as if to suggest that 
the football fans have only been able to behave because of the police, because we're all yobs. That's how we're all viewed as a as a starting point. Even when a, a game like that that he's tried to build up has resulted in in no disorder of note. And I think that's what underpins a lot of the. You know, that's what underpins the prejudice, I guess. It's the prejudice that underpins. Yeah, and and and, right. and it's as much to do with the reporting of it. Yeah, um, as, as it much to, to, to do with the politicians. I mean, to some extent, the politicians and the famous shame game thing. I mean, yeah. you were probably at that game. I yeah. was at that game. Uh, the only thing that I was aware of at that game was uh, was his face. The oh god, the the guy who who spat on when he played for Liverpool. Jeff. Jeff. The only thing I remember was Juf being held back by the police trying to get to the Rangers fans to throw his shot. Aye, he, he tried to get an even after he got sent off, didn't he? Yeah. Like, he did, I'm, I'm, I think he might, aye, he did. That he was sent the only off thing I was aware of at the game. It wasn't aye. until I got home. There were, there were more Rangers players booked that night than Celtic fans arrested, I'm sure. And most of the Celtic fans arrested were arrested for smoking in the toilet. I, I mean, the only people who were aware that there was any sort of controversy with the people watching the telly often... Yes. I remember joking with someone that yeah. it should have been the offensive behaviour by people watching football games on the telly act. Right? Because... Aye, aye, it was... Because there's no fans was, at the game were impacted by it. And then an example the, the, of the, the reporting... See the or if you go on the BBC News app, so you know how you can you can get your your chunks of what you want, and so I've got yeah. new, news for Glasgow in the West. The main mm-hmm. story for Glasgow in the West on the thirtieth of uh, December, and it was still in the top four stories by the second of January. Eleven arrested at Old Fun Game. <laughs> right, there was sixty thousand people there. I know. I With a piece of mind. legislation that makes it easier to arrest people, and there was 11 arrested. And then I looked up, and in Edinburgh's Hug Money celebrations, I was trying to find, nowhere did I find how many were arrested. There were yeah. 12 yeah, people arrested at 75,000 people. Because of course mm-hmm. you're going to get yeah. some petty crime going yeah, on. Yeah, large, large, large hundreds of people would have been on the drink. And I mean, Stuart Regan made a very good point at the Justice Committee. Um... Maybe a bit unlike him in some respects. He made a very good point about you know the comparison between the park, you know, when he rhymed off the huge list of offences that took part at Tina Park between uh, I think it was in a nine year span, uh, and you know at no point was anyone worried about the the assaults or the sexual assaults or the drug offences or the kidnapping or the attempted murders, you know, the, the, the huge list of criminal offences. Yet there was no you know call for. Um, emergency legislation at that point. Um, I mean, I, I remember after that, that shame game, one of my mates had a, had like a group of pals in Italy, and they were texting them, worried that is everyone okay? Did anything happen? Because they'd seen it in the news in Italy and thought that there was just this crazy amount of disorder in Glasgow, and there was absolutely nothing. I mean, if you remember that season, did, I think we played them seven times. Yeah. So, like, I, I remember thinking that the game was, in terms of the fans, the atmosphere was. It was getting a bit tame, they were getting a bit sick of the side each other. But I think it, it, it bred a bit of discontent between the players. I think they were all getting, mm-hmm. you know, really, you know, I think that, you know, like Jeff and Bagheera and, you know, like Sir Brown and Wesley and stuff on our side, you know, they were certainly getting each other's faces and that familiarity was certainly uh, breeding contempt. But with the fans, I, I think they were getting a, a bit bored it, to be honest. Um, and, you know, that game really on the the kind of scheme of things wasn't you know it wasn't a major flashpoint it wasn't major scenes of disorder certainly caused by the fans anyway um, but obviously um, you know they called the joint action group from that and then the following few months were certainly very you know tumultuous dark time in Scotland for the Irish diaspora and the way that certain figures were um, targeted um, and it was vile, but the bottom line is that you know sending a nail bomb, you know sending a, a bullet through the post or attacking a manager on the pitch side at Tynecastle was all criminal offences then, and they're criminal offences now. And the offensive behaviour that doesn't change any of that. And I think that's that's the key. See that the main right. There's, there's two parts to it. see the main bits of behaviour that people wouldn't want: people being assaulted, uh, racist mm-hmm. behaviour. Um, yeah, so, so all of that uh, tr- yeah. behaviour that's likely to cause trouble. All of that was illegal before the act. Yeah, yep, yeah, it was. 
what what it was was in the aftermath of that game, what happened was, you know, there was obviously the flashpoints that the media jumped on. Jack McConnell then starts giving the SNP, you know, a bit of grief for their, you know, perceived lack of activity on sectarianism because he had obviously made it quite a focal point of, of his premiership. Um and you know, Sam and his kind of took a bait in a reaction. They arranged this joint action group um, at him and Stephen House, and I think House um, probably seen you know he knew that the, the forces were about to be amalgamated. He seen an opportunity to prove his loyalty to his political masters, and he seen an opportunity to increase his public persona and his profile. And he grabbed it, and it obviously paid dividends for him because he eventually did. Um, you know, going to to take the kind of top role there before it all went a bit pear shaped for them. Um, but I, I do think it was as simple as, you know, certainly for Sam and certainly for the SNP, I think they thought it was just going to be a cheap political win. I don't think that there was a massive amount of thought. I mean, you can read it. I mean, I think the legislation speaks for itself. I don't think there was a massive, massive amount of thought put in to what it was they were doing, to what the legislation would criminalise what the impact would be um, and I think that they thought it would be a cheap political win to get some headlines at the time you know it wasn't an attempt to deal with you know, a deep rooted societal issue it was just about political points going um, and they thought that it would hopefully you know be fine protest for a bit but it would eventually go away and that hasn't happened um, and it's haunted them ever since so what's the next steps? Where are we? What can people do to get involved? Well, as of uh, the time of recording, I believe the Celtic Trust website is unfortunately down at the moment. Um, but I am assured by your technical team that it will hopefully be back up and running. So even by the time this airs, I'm hoping that the, the, the Trust website will be back up and running. But what I would urge people to do is, if you're a supporter, oops, sorry, I think it was my phone, if you're a supporter, go on and... Uh, take part in the email campaign all you need to do you then you input your postcode um, and then it'll bring up your uh, constituency MSP along with you know the various list of MSPs and it'll send off a kind of standard email with your name asking your name to support the repeal of the legislation now it can really be um, overstated you know the impact this is you know we've met with um, you know, MA, all the opposition parties uh, and the, MA, the SNP, I guess, the points as well. But one of the things they'll say is that, you know, if you come in on a Monday morning and you've got, you know, 60 emails in all asking the one thing, you know, it's a nightmare and it does put pressure on them. They do realise that this is an issue that isn't going to just go away. So what we need is for those who support us to just take the time, take the 30 seconds to go and put pressure on those people who have to go and vote. Um, within the next couple of weeks. I, however, understand that you know, I'm maybe not preaching uh, to the converted completely here, so I understand that there will be people who are maybe in the stands so and maybe don't feel um, as passionate about it as myself and other campaigners. What I would urge them to do is to, if they want to learn a wee bit more, if they want to see how this came about, see the impact that it's had and then maybe listen to some of the expert opinions from people with, you know, academic background, legal backgrounds, civil rights campaigners, things like that. If they want to hear from them, if they want to see what's happened, go and watch the, the short film that Fans Against Criminalisation made. It's about 55 minutes long, um, but I think it's worth a watch um, and hopefully that will um, help sway people slightly as well, but I guess we'll see. And how far away are we if things go well from this legislation being repealed? I'm always at, this is a question I get asked on almost a daily basis at this point by friends and everything else. I'm a bit wary about giving a specific timeline, but I do think we're very close. Um, I would hope that you know stage one has to be done uh, by the by this month. Um, so I would hope that you know we'll maybe move into stage two, hopefully about February. Um, and I would hope to have it have it done by, by hopefully March. April, I would think. Um, obviously, uh, you know, if this campaign stopped me anything, it's uh, you know things don't always need necessarily go to plan there's obviously a bit of bureaucracy there things could change but I genuinely think um, that well in course hopefully for a March April repeal 
Um, but as I say, we've, you know, it's not all done yet. We can't all rest on our laurels, um, and we need to try and make sure that enough pressure is put on the, the MSPs who have to vote to, to get this over the line. And there's only two votes in it, so yeah. a, a broken leg and a bout of uh, gastroenteritis yep. could, uh, yeah. could scupper everything, so it's really tight. Yep. Yeah, it really is. It's, it's you know, as I say, for us to to got to this point, you know, to have, you know, some of the things that fans have endured, some of the things that have happened over these six years, for us to persevere. Um, and I don't mean the campaign, I mean the full support uh, and football supporters across Scotland as well. For us to persevere with this campaign and get it to this point, it would be such a shame um, if it fell short at this point, just because you know we didn't do enough in the final stages so you know it's, it's kind of the light is at the end of the tunnel is what I'm saying um, and we're just asking people for one last push ok so um, so yeah is it going to be uh, are they going to win it on, is it going to be one on penalties is it going to go extra time is it <laughs> I, I don't know I think I'll be losing my hair come the, the time of these two votes um, it'll be pretty nerve wracking stuff but listen I mean I, I think that I do think that we'll be able to appeal it you know I do think we'll win and I'm confident but there's obviously small things that are outside of our control you know I hope but um, you know everybody needs to stay, stay fit and healthy and make sure they're there for the votes but um, as I just say we just need to keep the pressure up and then hopefully um, we can put the party bus to pick us all up from parliament in the day of the vote ok well with that I will say Paul thanks very much Excellent. Thanks very much for having us on. I really massively appreciate it. And thanks to everyone as well who took the time to watch the video. Um, and a massive, massive thanks to everyone who took time to take part in the email campaign. You look good out there, baby. found that illuminating and enlightening and if you want to do something about it if you go to celtictrust.net onto their website front page email your msp today ask the act it is a really simple process and i'll talk you through so go to celtictrust.net you can either click on email your msp today ask the act and it will tell you what to do or you can just go straight to the right and I'll talk you through it as I'm doing it right now contact your MSP there's a description about contacting your MSP instructions go down to the bottom of the page type in your postcode blah 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 press find my MSP and there you go it gives me my constituency MSP and my list MSPs and then I can click on them and email them straightforward really straightforward and they even have an email template dear MSP's name and you can copy and paste that in really really straightforward if you're at all motivated by the principle of a piece of legislation that says see all society's problems they're all your fault because you're a dirty down market football fan and you don't think that quite right then I would urge you to do this and make sure as you hear Paul say so only two votes in it only needs one guy to fall and break his leg one woman to have an appendix operation or whatever and there's a problem enough of me ranting on this is me Harry Brady that was him Paul Quidley of Friends Against Criminalization let me see you wave your hand I know a change gonna come ah. oh yes it will but I've gotta take my say this look Yes, sir. And I tell him, I said, brother, help me please. <laughs> but he winds up <laughs> knocking me. He knocks me back down on, back down on my
Somebody take your hand back and forth like this. Everybody, everybody. You sitting in the first balcony too. Heavenly please. All over the auditorium tonight. All over the auditorium. Hallelujah. When he winds up. 